Episcopal Church was required to proclaim and sign a statement which begins, I solemnly declare that I do believe the Holy Scriptures of the Old and New Testaments to be the Word of God and to contain all things necessary to salvation. I still believe that. And I also believe that there are many ways to interpret and use that belief. We Episcopalians are taught the concept of a three-legged stool of scripture, tradition, and reason. The ordination ceremony assumes we will apply tradition and reason to the word of God and what we are supposed to do about it. We are not called to be stuck in some tar pit of historical theology. My first observation is that Christians have a curious relationship with what we call the Old Testament or the Hebrew Scriptures. In a lot of Christian thought, the New Testament or Christian Scriptures have superseded the Hebrew Scriptures. One of the reasons that relationship between Hebrew and Christian Scriptures is curious has to do with medieval Christianity. Medieval theology developed the idea that God is omniscient and omnipotent. That is, God knows everything and God can do anything. Omniscience also means that God knows the end from the beginning and nothing can surprise God. But the Hebrew scriptures present a God who is not omniscient at all. Yet medieval Christianity considered the Hebrew scriptures to be inerrant. Like fundamentalism believes today, Holy Scripture in any of its parts cannot be in error. As an example, Galileo's writings about how the earth circles the sun were banned by the Pope because they contradicted the passage about how Joshua, following God's command, made the sun stand still. Therefore, the sun must circle the earth. <laughs> Despite this, the doctrine of omniscience ignores passages like this one that, from Exodus today, where God is trying to find out whether the people will follow God's instructions or not. Belief in God's omniscience also leads us directly into the Calvinist point of view that everything is predetermined, including where any of us is bound in the afterlife. A problem with this way of thinking is that it makes any attempt to have an upstanding life pointless, since our fate is already predetermined. So why try? This tied the conservative Calvinists in knots, trying to explain why we should try to be holy or moral and ethical, or even have anything to do with the church at all. There's another reason why Christians have trouble with the Hebrew scriptures. That is the idea that the God we meet there is more violent and vengeful than the God Jesus introduced us to. When someone speaks of a violent and vengeful God, we often hear that referred to as an Old Testament God. However, we also encounter Christians who refer back to that kind of God when explaining that earthquakes and tornadoes strike because God is mad at the cities and countries that they hit. I should point out here that most of modern Judaism also believes in grace and mercy, that the Hebrew scriptures speak of God's love, and that Christian scriptures mention God's wrath. The dividing line, dividing line is not clear. Another facet of this discussion is that we often forget that for several hundred years after Jesus' life on earth, Christians did not have a canonical New Testament. For that first generation, when they spoke of scripture, they meant the Hebrew scriptures. There were no Christian scriptures. They did have some letters, mostly from Paul, but also James, John, and Jude, which were considered authoritative and the gospels began to appear on the scene. About the year 120, our current New Testament's 27 books were recognized, but it took another 200 years for Christianity to settle on a New Testament canon. Different traditions still recognize other books as well, which we Episcopalians call the Apocrypha. And when we look at New Testament writings, we see the authors referring back to the Hebrew scriptures, as Paul does in this passage from Ephesians, trying to draw a parallel between those ancient writings and the Christian understanding of them. If we want to know how the church was creating and understanding itself through scripture and the Holy Spirit, we have to read the Hebrew scriptures. 
But at the same time, we have to resist the idea that everything in there is supposed to be literally believed and practiced by Christians. The teachings of Jesus and the apostles are clear that we have received a revelation of God through Jesus that both explains and revises the law, the Torah. And there are implicit and explicit exceptions to what continues to be doctrine and practice for Christians. We are expected to understand that Jesus has both fulfilled the law and replaced it with a gospel of love and peace. Not that the law has nothing to teach us, far from it. <coughs> Excuse me. But we are no longer supposed to look at obedience to the law as our source of either salvation or a relationship with God. In our reading from John today, we are presented with a crowd of people who followed Jesus and the disciples around until they wore them out. And like most such encounters recorded in the Gospel of John, Jesus is unnervingly indirect with them. Or rather, he is so direct that he bypasses the things they need to hear if they are to understand him. He is clearly trying to draw them in, to get them to ask questions that will take them deeper into the meaning of who and what Jesus is. Echoing the reading from Exodus, his questioners ask Jesus to justify his presence among them by comparing him to Moses, the lawgiver. Like so many people in John, they are looking for signs and wonders. Jesus miraculously fed thousands of people, but they ask for something more from him in order to prove his right to teach them. At this point, Jesus does not answer the question they intended. He answers the question they should have asked, the one they really need the answer to. You should not be looking to Moses, he tells them. What Moses gave your ancestors is not what you need. I am the only one who can give you what you need. Jesus wants them to reorder their thinking, to understand God and God's true gift as being something spiritual rather than physical. The bread of life is not manna. It is Jesus himself. He is telling them that the time of Moses as their source of religious identity is over. Their religious identity from now on should be the teachings, the example, and the living presence of Jesus Christ in Holy Spirit, bread, and wine. Now, when I try to apply this thinking to my current experience, I find this understanding missing in a lot of what I hear these days about Christianity and religion. First comes the Christian nationalist notion that we can go back to the law, as illustrated by the idea that posting the Ten Commandments in schoolrooms will cause children to internalize those teachings. Now, I am older than some of you, maybe most of you, and I remember the way we started the day in elementary school. I'm talking about public schools in Tacoma, not a parochial school. We would say the Pledge of Allegiance, and a student would be asked to read a passage from the Bible. We might say the Lord's Prayer, and we would certainly hear about the Golden Rule. Now, I went to violent schools in Tacoma, and it could just as easily be the kid who read from the Bible who was knocking you around on the playground. <laughs> the teachers who assigned the Bible readings were certainly not going to come and help out if you got in trouble. They disappeared at recess. Second, it's true that for the most part, the people who wrote the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution were Christians, but they were not fundamentalists and did not share their viewpoints on biblical inerrancy and Christian nationhood. Many of them were Church of England, which later became the Episcopal Church. Thus, they had long and bitter experience of the intertwining of church and state in the British Empire. One of the common ways of understanding Christianity in those days was called deism. Anybody know about deism? No? There's one. <laughs> Deists believed in a God who was not very involved with us, who created everything and then backed off. The most common idea about God's involvement with us was called Providence, thus the capital of Rhode Island, which was something God had set up ahead of time for us to encounter. 
To them, God might wish us well, but God did not participate in politics. Jefferson, perhaps the most radical deist, wrote his own Bible, which was the gospel with all the miracles scissored out. He understood Christianity as nothing more than a set of ethical teachings by Jesus. Now, deism is open to a lot of criticism, but when people talk about the U.S. being founded as a Christian nation, it has nothing to do with the Christianity they are thinking of. The nation's founders were trying to protect both the church from the state and the state from the church. Our Episcopal heritage is one of working within the nation, not being part of the nation's government as a church. The church is called to be a witness within society, not to run society. Although individual Christians are encouraged to be involved in government, to vote, to run for office themselves, as well as supporting candidates and causes, writing letters and donating. Christianity as Jesus taught it was not a set of laws that would make us all moral. It was the living presence of Christ as a focus for and creator of an inner relationship, which would result in a change in how a believer viewed the world and acted within it. It had to do with public morality, but it did not govern it. My kingdom is not of this world, Jesus told Pilate. It was not meant as a political stance or something to be defended or encouraged by force, whether legal force or physical force. It is the product of hearts open to the love of God and acting on that love. Law is no longer the open door to God's blessing, and the later use of Christianity to proclaim the divine rights of kings and emperors was foreign to the teachings of the New Testament, although it was not foreign to the Hebrew Scriptures, which was a religion of one nation. Religion was profoundly altered by the advent of the Son of God into the world. It stepped away from the notion of nationalistic warrior gods into an understanding of a universal creator and lover of that creation, especially a lover of all humans, calling them into the family of that creator out of love. If we think of religion as something to be defended by force of arms, if we think of any given nation as more blessed or more loved by God than other nations, if we think of God as blessing those who follow a law and cursing those who fail to follow it in any point, we are centered more in the Hebrew scriptures than in the Christian scriptures. There's much to be learned from Moses and the other people of the Hebrew scriptures. Moses is a difficult and complex character who both succeeded and failed and learned a great deal about God along the way but to follow or obey him takes us in the wrong direction. It is Jesus we are meant to worship, follow, and obey, insofar as we hear him and understand him in our Christian community. Amen.